Okay, I'm one of the organizers of the novel state of matter program that's running uh, here uh, this week and the following two weeks. And it is my great pleasure to introduce our colloquium speaker today, Ali Azdani. Uh, Ali did his graduate work at Stanford with Aaron Kaplonik. Uh, then moved to the uh, University of Illinois, spent uh, quite a long time, maybe a decade there, almost a decade, and then uh, joined Princeton, where he has been there ever since. Uh, Ali's, as you'll see today, his main tool is scanning tunneling microscopy, but he's a really pioneer in this type of technique, uh, both in terms of developing the capability of this technique to be able to do uh, really amazing experiments looking at a specific spot in the sample as you vary both temperature and large magnetic field. This has been a real challenge in the field. Um, he's been a first in many, many discoveries. He's been looking at strongly correlated matter, superconductivity, high temperature superconductivity, heavy fermion systems. And most recently, uh, something that it has been really kind of waiting to happen and that is doing SCM into these uh, layered materials such as graphene, uh, where people thought that they're too fragile and too, you know, the technique will be too invasive in order to be able to do experiments. Uh, at least we basically were able to show that that's not the case and uh, really uh, extract amazing physics. So this, I think. Thank you, Amir. So it's a great pleasure to be back here in Aspen in person and uh, give a colloquium and it's been a, a great program so far um, here. and i want to thank the organizers for uh, putting together this novel phase of matter with, and i'm happy to represent our community to you today about some of the problems that we're thinking about in this uh in this workshop um as a way of just getting started i can get my not to start working. It's working a moment ago. Which is a battery. Yeah, he wants me to say it. Not it. It's a nice picture. It's a nice picture, I know. Here we go. This is also a nice picture. This is, there are two pictures here telling us, telling you about the two things that we try to exploit to find new phases of matter in, in materials. One is the correlation between electrons. Look for situations in which electrons are strongly interacting with one another. These are, these are cases that are very difficult to theoretically actually predict what will happen. And it has given us some of the most exotic things that uh, we're still trying to understand, uh, such as uh, insulators, mod insulators, things called spin liquids. And you might have remember high temperature superconductivity. Uh, in uh, cuprates is one of the materials in which strong interaction between the electrons is a superconductivity at very high temperature or the presence of these interactions have such phenomena. And in the last decade, or even longer, but uh, very intensely in the last decade, uh, we have realized that the role of the topology of the electronic wave functions was going back to discovery of quantum Hall, fractional quantum Hall effect, and more recently, topological insulators and search for topological superconductors have found in which situation in which the electronic wave functions have features that are beyond single particle physics, in which the topology is important to describe the electronic. And uh, we are now actually uh, embarking in a in material system which actually combines these two things together and giving us a phenomena uh, which is quite exciting. That's what I'm going to tell you about is a material system which actually has both of these features in it uh, in the today's talk. So just starting with correlations, let me just also say that the way which traditionally we, we have gone about discovery of uh, um, correlated matter is to, to use the magic of chemistry, to make solid state chemistry, basically engineer materials in which we can create very complex situation landscapes for electrons to move to and in which interaction between the electrons is very complicated to simulate in, you know, in calculations, 
but uh, solid state chemists have these intuitions of where to look for exotic materials such as high temperature superconductors. These materials are very difficult to understand just because they're just looking at the structure. There is a lot of degrees of freedom, a lot of different uh, uh, orbitals, <clears throat> things we, which are very hard to put together uh, from uh, starting from atoms, getting all the way to strong correlation is a very difficult problem. We always look for model situations. And the, the, the challenges in this field actually has, I would say, uh, sort of spawn on the interest in, for example, cold atoms as, as a sort of uh, model systems like optical lattices in which you can create a sort of model situation in which you can study interactions uh, in, a, in a control setting. And in the last, uh, I would say, um, few years or so, uh, we have uh, come upon a situation where we can start with rather simple uh, um, building blocks, sheets of graphene, sheets of two-dimensional materials that are chemically relatively simple. And with these simple components, we have found that we can exhibit very uh, strongly interacting and topological behavior. And this is the topic of Moray super lattices, uh, which has uh, come about uh, uh, the last few years starting with people playing around with two-dimensional materials and twisting them. This is what I want to tell you about today. So the, the kind of length scale involved here, is not on the atomic scale, uh, you know, the distance between the atoms is actually about you know, 100 angstroms or so. The energy scales are, are smaller. The interaction between the electrons is going to be much smaller on this, on this scale. It's still on the range, which is experimentally accessible in laboratories at low temperatures. And of course, when you start with chemically pure systems and having the ability to manipulate sort of sheets of two-dimensional material gives you a new degree of freedom we didn't have before. It's giving us a way in which we can uh, create interacting, as I show you, and topological systems. This is kind of an exciting area uh, that we are playing around with. So let me start with, uh, how this field got started. Uh, this is just two sheets of graphene placed on top of one another and, and twisted uh, a, a little bit. Uh, and what you can see is the interference between the two graphene lattices is what your eye is picking up. This is what we call the Moray super lattice coming from this two periodic pattern. And what we are doing is basically subjecting electrons to this longer periodicity. And it would seem like a very simple thing to do. You just have another lattice, but actually it has major consequences of what electrons are doing uh, on such a lattice. And uh, this is sort of how this field got started. Uh, also, I just wanna highlight that this is just graphene, but we have not been able to isolate many different types of two dimensional materials. These are materials that are layers are weakly bounded by Van der Waals forces. And you can literally take Scotch tape take them apart, peel them down to a single monolayer. And as I'll show you how we, we have tricks of stacking them and putting on top of one another. And some of these are air stable and some are not. So there are challenges in how you make such materials. But the, uh, just to give you a perspective, the number of layered materials is in the thousands. So uh, we have just begun to scratch the surface of what is possible uh, to put together, to create this sort of uh, array of materials which are controllable, for example, with this twist. I mean, you might wonder, you know, what happens to the electronic properties of graphene when you, when, you, when you do this? And this was a question that was started to be addressed theoretically about a decade ago. Let me just remind you, uh, graphene is this very special material uh, which the carbon atoms band structure such that you have, you know, two bands uh, that touch each other uh, in the band structure, in the, this is the, in the momentum space, this is a function of energy, and basically a Brillouin zone, which is hexagonal like the graphene lattice. And uh, you have these Dirac points, which is the touching points between the conduction and the valence band in graphene. Graphene is a, is a sort of a zero band gap semiconductor. Okay. It has this very special property of having this Dirac spectrum, it's a low energy quasi particle. What we are doing is we're taking two these sheets of graphene and putting on top of one another and thinking about what will happen if you twist them relative to one another. So this was a question that a number of people, most notably Alan McDonald and his collaborator, 
uh, addressed about a decade ago in, in a paper uh, where they considered, uh, you know, if you have two copies of graphene and you know, couple them together and allow electrons to tunnel between the, the two sheets, what will happen to this sort of Dirac and structure? So uh, what is shown here is the overlap of the, you know, two of those Dirac points in the and structure I just showed you. If you start now allowing electrons to tunnel between the two sheets, of course, you get hybridization between these two electronic bands, and you start to get, you know, uh, open up a gap, if you wish. There is, there is a point here where it will be that the, the bands start to bend relative to one another because of the tunneling of electrons uh, between the two sheets. Now, if you start to wonder what the energy scale of this, uh, this interaction inner layer interaction is as a function of the twist angle uh, between these two layers, uh, they realize that as you twist things to uh, a, a, a sort of a very small angle, it can be situations where these bands that they're very highly dispersive, very linear, become flatter and flatter and flatter. In fact, what they discovered, this is a calculation, it's just a bunch of spaghettis, you know, band structure calculation can be very complicated. And you have, you can have many, many bands uh, in this situation. And what you have here is you have electrons are basically scattering uh, from this periodic Moray potential, okay? And what they discovered is that there are certain magic angles, in this particular case, one degree, <laughs> in which the dispersion that you had that was linear becomes basically extremely flat, close to zero. You have, of course, many other bands going on here. The special thing has to do with when you have a situation where you force all the electrons to be at the same energy. Okay. And uh, this is a situation if you, I always, I always tell my students, go back to the original paper and read to the end. You read the last paragraph of this paper and the authors were uh, kind of, you know, were thinking out loud saying, Okay, what, would, what could happen if somebody make this in the lab? Uh, you realize what you have here is you can, if you can fill electrons into this band, you're basically forcing electrons to strongly interact with one another. They're at the same energy. Yeah. Electrons want to try to stay out of each other's way, and they can do that in a number of different ways, you'll see. And they can make a lot of different kinds of states, which you cannot predict because uh, they, this becomes a very interactive problem if you are forcing electrons to be at the same energy. In fact, we have a very nice example of this in, our, in the history of our field where we make flat bands. Is that is a situation when you take electrons that are moving in a, in a sheet in two dimensions and apply a very large magnetic field. Yeah. Basically force electrons into lambda levels, have basically a flat dispersion. They are just uh, discrete levels. And as we partially filled these uh, lambda levels, they gave us basically the fractional quantum Hall effect and exotic things such as fractional charge, and potentially non-abelian quantum states, which we are uh, still trying to examine. So we are very familiar with situations where once you make flat bands, nice things can happen. This is a very nicely motivated uh, 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 effort to try to make such a material. And uh, just to kind of uh, sort of bring you along, uh, if you include also uh, the, the, this, the relaxation of the crystal when you make such a structure, which you can simulate on a computer, the lattice is gonna relax. But what happened is, is these, you get two flat bands that in, the cal in, the cal uh, in the prediction or the calculation, which are well separated from what I call remote bands, okay? This is a kind of very nice situation where you can start to fill electrons and kind of really get into filling just these two bands at the, at the Fermi energy and, and see what the electronics now, the richness of this system is not that it's just flat, but also remember graphene had this uh, you know, special band structure. There were these uh, you know, hexagonal lattice, which in the momentum space also gives you two inequivalent points, uh, which we call valley degrees of freedom, two electronic valleys that you can fill in. So electrons in this system actually have uh, a lot of degrees of freedom. So there is two spin, uh, there is two valleys, and we have two bands. So you not, you not only can make states that are, if you wish, polarized in one degree of freedom, but you have the freedom to make any combination of them, mm -hmm. coherence, you know, co make coherent quantum states 
in any combination of such things. So just looking at this, you can sort of see, you know, uh, you can do things that are very hard to predict. That's what you need to explain. How do you do this in the laboratory? It's actually from my lab, but these techniques were invented at Columbia University. Uh, there's a number of pioneers in the 2D field who are working on graphene. We actually came late to this business, as you mentioned. We, we, we are microscopists, as you'll see. But this is how you do this. You, you, you scotch tape, take a piece of graphite, and you start peeling graphite, and you stick it to a piece of silicon oxide away from it. And uh, if you do this enough, once in a while, you, you notice that there is a very small flake, which has a very characteristic feature in optical imaging, uh, which you can identify as being a monolayer of graphene. Now, the way we handle these things in the laboratory, we use uh, basically a glass slide with a piece of polymer glued to the end of the glass slide. So you can look through the glass slide, the polymer that's uh, basically transparent and it's sticky. And you can use this to pick up uh, pieces of two-dimensional material to create your structure. Now, you can actually tear graphene. Nowadays, we actually use an atomic force microscope to actually make a tear cut. And then we go in and pick up one piece of graphene uh, uh, from this corner, and we uh, stack it on the other piece of graphene, and we use tricks like right. using polymers which have different melting temperature uh, to basically manipulate this structure uh, to create devices where you have two pieces of graphene. And when you do this pickup, you actually have very, uh, you, um, you have very um, precise angular alignment in order to get down to a fraction of a degree in terms of how you stack these things on top of one top. It's difficult, very hard samples to make. Success rate is very low, but you know, people are very focused on physics and then developing new techniques to make these things you know, reproducible like mass scale, but this is coming. Okay. So the person, there was a long list of people who worked on this problem before uh, uh, the big discovery that came in 2018 from Pablo Jerry Herrera's group at MIT. Uh, he basically uh, went to create the structure that Alan McDonald had predicted, sheets of graphene stuck on top of one another at one degree precisely uh, misaligned. And uh, this is measuring conductivity as a function of carrier density. And this is uh, a field in which we can, the, the nice thing about these devices is that we can tune how many electrons we have in our device by basically using an electrical capacitance from a gate in the nearby underneath the structure. We are tuning the number of carriers uh, in, in our system. This looks like, a, 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 to you, maybe a, a messy slide. Let me just uh, tell you what you're looking at. I told you that there are eight degrees of freedom uh, with, when, it, when we are talking about these flat bands, spin and the valley, you can completely deplete them. You can deplete these bands. And you're basically, your chemical potential is stuck between these flat bands and other states, you have a, an insulator. This is an ordinary insulator. It's like silicon at very low temperature. You can fill them completely and it would, uh, it would also behave like an insulator. The conductivity is very low. Nice thing is what happens when you partially fill them, where you have options to create different kinds of states of all these degrees of freedom. The first tell that we were creating something interesting is that when you put, for example, uh, two electrons in this partially filled band, you normally expect to get a metal. Uh, what he observed is that the system, as you cool it down, it becomes an insulator. The same if you uh, fill up uh, six electrons and leave two holes behind, you expect that to be also a metal, uh, but he found it to be an insulator. And what was more exciting was that, uh, so here is a, a similar diagram which shows the same information. The carrier density is being tuned here. And this spot uh, in this uh, carrier density corresponds to uh, this doping arrangement of these flat bands. And this is the one we would expect it to be a metal. It turned out to be an insulator. And then when he, uh, uh, when Pablo and his students doped a little bit away, added a little bit carriers, just a little bit on this side or the other side, found that the system became a super. These two sheets of graphene, it's on top of one another. 
it was superconducting at around uh, one Kelvin or so. Now, it looks very familiar to condensed matter physicists, this diagram, because it looks like this other diagram that we've been trying to understand like 35 years. This is a diagram of a copper oxide layered superconductors. So you have layers of copper oxygen. You have other layers in the material which you use to dope the carrier density in the copper oxide plane. You can dope it with electron, you can dope it with holes, okay? And uh, you, if you dope it with holes, you don't dope it, it's an antiferromagnetic insulator, a Mott insulator. And if you dope it a little bit, this insulator turns into a superconductor superconductivity that can reach up to 165 degrees Kelvin. And this type of diagram is very common to almost all the superconductors, low or high in temperature, which we are trying to understand. So having a system in which you have relatively simple components, just carpet and a gate, that show this behavior is something that's very exciting. And this is what we are trying to understand right now. Now, let me fast forward just to what's happening right now in the field, so that's 2018. So what, you would say, why stop at two? So you can go to number of larger layers and uh, one of our organizers, are you an organizer? Yes, one of our organizers, Ashwin Vishwanath and his, uh, his colleagues uh, analyzed the situation and looking to see what the, what the conditions would be when you have multiple layers where you could get again flat bands. What they discovered is that you have situations in which you have flat bands. These flat bands sometimes are just like the bilayer case. They are in isolation. Sometimes they are uh, uh, coexisting with other uh, bands, which are the Dirac bands of the graphene that we, I showed you at the beginning. And what's exciting about his prediction is that Pablo, uh, Philip Kim's group, and also Stevan Najpergi's group at Caltech uh, they went out and, and they've been making such devices and they are, they have found that when you make such, uh, and they make uh, these multiple layer system to the right angle, dope them, uh, they again discover superconductor. We don't know precisely right now whether this is just a bi-layer superconductivity in disguise with other layers nearby, a sort of, uh, um, you know, observers. But what is interesting is that these superconductors seems to also become more robust in some sense. They're easier to make samples. That's what we find in the laboratory. So this is kind of an expanding field right now. This is just graphene. Uh, and we, we, of course, there's a larger field in which we are uh, trying to make layers with many other materials. So in terms of physics questions, uh, we are kind of still in the dark. Uh, about what is the nature of this insulating state. Initially, it was thought that maybe it's a Mott insulator. We have reasons to believe that it's not a Mott insulator. I showed you all these degrees of freedom, spin, valley, so on. It's easy to imagine, and theorists have predicted, states in which you create a sort of a, a special spin polarized or valley polarized or some ordered state, a broken symmetry state, which becomes an insulator. We're trying to understand what are these insulators. The reason we try to understand them is that we know once we dope them a little bit, it becomes a superconductor. And then the question is, what's the nature of superconductivity? So I'll show you today, there's some experiments in my lab that shows that this is not your garden variety conventional PCS superconductor with lead and aluminum. It's, it's different. And we are also trying to see whether uh, you know, what is the pairing mechanism and how it connects to this insulator? These are some of the exciting questions in our field. And perhaps if, if it turns out to be controllable, it may give us a way in which to study superconductivity in the presence of strong correlation in a controlled experimental setting. So I'm gonna today show you experiments, how these strong interaction between electrons show up experimentally. I'm gonna show you some uh, how, studies of the superconductivity show you that it's very unusual. It shows some eerie characteristic features such as those high temperature superconductors besides this sort of the phase diagram when superconductivity. Okay, so this is the most important slide. These are the people who have done all the work. Uh, the work that I'm gonna be showing today is uh, led by Kevin, Mongchul, and Dylan, and Ryan. 
and collaborating with my colleague Andre Bernevik, who's a theorist, is in key. Uh, Galara and uh, Xiao Ming actually work on a related project. Their efforts into creating ultra clean graphene layers is actually what made our experiments possible. Okay, so let me tell you what, what I do for a living. Uh, I use a very sharp tip in a very controlled environment, very low temperatures, ultra high vacuum, very low vibration. Uh, and I, we bring it next to materials of interest, have tunneling. And then we raster the tip and we, we create images either by, uh, for example, keeping the tunneling current constant, recording the trajectory of the tip. This is like a topography, what we call in the scanning tunneling microscope. At every location in this image, we can basically stop the tip and record the rate at which the electrons tunnel between the tip and the sample. This gives you the measure of the tunneling density of states. It gives you a measure of the excitation spectrum of whatever state you're studying. You have a superconductor, as I'll show you, you will have a superconducting gap telling you this order has formed, it gives you a gap. And you can make maps of what this, of what this information look like in real space. And uh, in the past, you know, when we, I studied rates for, I don't know, a decade or more, maybe de two decades, uh, when we wanted to vary some parameter, we just had to go to the person who grew the sample and, you know, can you make me another sample with a slightly different condition and repeat this procedure again and again. But now in this field of two-dimensional gated structures, we have a crystalline device which is made out of these crystalline layers and with the gating in situ, we are basically in one experiment, we are able to explore many different aspects of the electronic property of that system by changing the density in situ. And you can think of doing many other type of experiments in situ, like applying strain or other things uh, which, which would come in handy in this system. We use this to study a lot of different electronic systems. This is what I do for a living. And so let me, let me show you what this, what this magic angle graphene system looks like under the microscope. So there is a lot of effort that gone into making a clean sample because we use these plastics, these polymers to pick up all these things and polymers are sticky. And polymers are things that are insulating. And when you wanna do tunneling, if they stick around you ruin your experiment. So you have to create very clean surfaces and a lot of effort has gone into doing just that. When you do that, you, you, you make a magic angle graphene sample this is what it looks like. The scale here is rather large. You wanna see the atoms here on a very, very fine scale that actually this projector is not allowing me to project at all. You see actually two length scale in this problem. It's clearly this length scale. This is the Moray length scale of the two graphene lattices that are twisted by just one degree relative to one another. Okay, you might say, why does this look bright? The reason it looks bright because if you have those flat bands, you know, flat bands have very large density of states compared to dispersing bands. And those flat bands have their intensity <laughs> on locations in which the two sublattice of graphene on top and on the bottom are almost aligned with one another. This structure goes between aligned AA stacking, not aligned, not aligned, and back to AA stacking. And in fact, from the periodicity of this Moray superstructure, you can just read off this is the angle that you have created the sample at. Okay. So um, there's a lot of information just here. You also see this other smaller periodicity here. This is because we, we always create these samples with a boron nitride uh, material underneath to protect it from any kind of fluctuations on the gate underneath. Boron nitride is a an insulator, but it looks just like graphene. And his lattice constant is almost the same as graphene, but not quite the same. And that creates another periodicity for this structure. This is kind of a complex situation. Yeah. Alignment or misalignment with boron nitride, and you have what the angle is. And of course, if you look very carefully, these triangles may not be exactly triangular. They could be actually a bit of strain in the device, depending on how you made the sample. It could be sample to sample. You can get all that information here. And uh, these bright spots is basically telling you they have large density of states uh, from the flat band on these AA location. And this is, this is expected uh, from this kind of theoretical calculation. Now, let me, let me show you uh, how the uh, interaction between the electrons manifests itself in such an experiment. 
remember, um, we can we have this gate. We can vary the, the gate voltage. When we vary the gate voltage, we can take these flat bands and take them from below the chemical potential to above the chemical potential. And the chemical potential appears as zero in my plots. Okay. I'm going to have to get back to positions later. I think, uh, uh, zero in my uh, plots here. And you see there are these two peaks. Okay. These are the two flat bands. The width of the peaks actually tells you how much dispersion they have in momentum space. It's not perfectly flat, some dispersion. And you see that they're below the chemical potential here, 40 volts on the gate. And they, at minus 40 volts, when I basically repel electrons, I can just completely deplete these uh, two flat bands. But all the fun stuff happens is when we are between 40 and minus 40. Okay, this looks like a busy, busy, busy slide, but don't worry, I'll, I'll go through it. This panel here is just what I showed you before. It's just when the two peaks, they're below the zero mark, and they're just marching towards zero adjusting the gate. These two bright features correspond to these two lines, this plot. So this is a color plot. This is, I'm varying the electronic density on this axis. And on this axis, I'm interrogating the electronic system by asking, you know, what does it look like if I want to add or remove an electron uh, to the system? This is the spectroscopy that you can do with the SD. The most important feature from this mess of data is that when you look here and you look here, you see very sharp peaks. And when you look in the middle here, you see very big blurry plot peaks. Okay. That's actually the most important message of this slide. Okay. Now, there are finer features that, uh, which I want to get into. That basically tells you that when you try to add an electron or remove an electron, that excitation, which was very well defined in energy, suddenly becomes very broad. And you ask, why, could, why should this happen? And the reason this happens is that when you partially fill these bands, the electrons, there is a lot of fluctuations of what the electrons can do because they're strongly interacting with one another. This, in, this Coulomb interaction between the electrons, this sharp spectral weight, and just makes it broad on the scale of that interaction energy. This is the first, first indication we have very strong correlation between the electrons in the system. And what's funny is that this is actually the first time we could do such an experiment because we could never have a system where we could tune it. It was not interacting. Why is it not interacting? Not interacting when those bands are completely filled or they're completely empty. Nothing, they can't do anything. You can do some interaction, but it's not going to be as exciting when they're partially filled. When you partially fill them and they're, they're these flat bands, then you see the effect of very strong interaction. Now, you see, you, I noticed that there are these finer features in the data. You can actually kind of see them. So there are these two lines that come in and they go out. These are the two flat bands, they come in. This is where all the region of all the interesting physics is, which we're gonna focus on today. Uh, and you can sort of see there's a lot of interesting things going on in the system. Uh, and you can try to bring that out uh, by basically taking, so we are measuring tunneling conductivity, but whenever we measure tunneling conductance, we also set the tip at a certain height above the tip. And that starting condition has a certain overall conductance, which we can normalize away from the data. And that takes the differences between how the measurement was set up when you vary this axis. And you can kind of see that there is this repeated features uh, in, the, in the spectrum. Now, this is what the system does. It's at very warm temperature before it becomes an insulator, because it before it becomes a superconductor. And I told you all this blurry business is, is, is signatures of interaction between the electrons. It turns out that these finer features in the data, although we cannot fully understand them, uh, right now we can't compute them theoretically, can be understood if you just go back to the picture that I showed you about where do electrons live in the system. Electrons live inside these flat bands. Where are these flat bands? Flat bands are kind of living in this sort of moray lattice-like structure, which are kind of like regions which are of the order of 10 nanometer in size. And electrons are kind of trapped. These flat band electrons are sort of trapped uh, in, inside these regions, but they hop in between, uh, between them. And making some sort of a simple model, this is like not even a model, this is like a basic 
sort of back of envelope calculation almost. We kind of understand the features in this data by just the fact that the Coulomb interaction between the electrons makes the energy of adding and removing the electrons this cascade of features, which is sort of reminiscent of what we see in the experiment. So these features are sort of the first indications of interaction between the electron in this material. Let me actually skip this, get to uh, the, the, the heart of the question that we wanna ask. So the system becomes a superconductor when you cool it down. And now we wanna ask the question, uh, what is the nature of superconductivity? So what does a normal superconductor look to us when we use this tool? The tool we, we are using is tunneling spectrometer. Tunneling, uh, it basically measures the quasi-particle density of states. In a superconductor, you have a gap for adding and removing an electron, adding a quasi-particle excitation. And uh, that gap basically uh, has a, you know, edge of it is a distinct singularity. This is a sort of BCS density of states uh, having to do with uh, basically the quasi-particle spectrum in a normal superconductor. And when you have a superconductor like aluminum, uh, it has a, a, a spectrum, uh, which is, you can explain very well with the BCS theory and extract the energy gap uh, having to do with the pairing strength of the electrons in aluminum. I told you I spent more than a decade or two working on high temperature superconductors. So what does a high temperature superconductor look like when you do such an experiment? I told you high temperature superconductors are like this magic angle graphene are complicated. There is this dome, uh, which is you can tune the superconducting transition temperature by doping. If you dope it a lot, uh, when you're on this side, you measure the tunneling density of state just like you do in aluminum. The curve has some distinct features. One, the most important one is that it looks very V shaped. The reason this is important is that uh, the superconductivity in high temperature superconductor is, has a, okay, has a pairing symmetry, which is not that of aluminum. In aluminum, basically pair electrons equally in all direction in momentum space. If you think about what we call a Fermi surface in a metal, the pairing strength is the same in all directions uh, in aluminum which gives you this, uh, this gap uh, that's very, uh, you know, very hard at, at its bottom. In high temperature superconductors, uh, we know that the pairing of the, uh, of the Cooper pairs is in a finite angular momentum channel. It's in the, in the uh, D wave channel, in the L equals two channel, which basically has directions just like a D orbitals in which the pairing strength basically vanishes. If you, if you do this experiment, which tests the strength of pairing uh, uh, by tunneling an electron or ripping an electron out of the sample, you're basically averaging over this Fermi surface. That's why the curve looks like this V-shaped curve. If you uh, do experiments, which we, we have done more than a decade ago, and actually follow this as a function of temperature, it has some unusual behavior, such that actually pairing can sometimes persist beyond temperature at which uh, we have bulk superconductivity from these measurements, uh, depending on, for example, where you are on the sample. But for the most part, uh, this type of spectrum, very consistent at very low energy with this picture of electrons being paired up in this L equals two <laughs> panel, a, uh, a channel. This is something that's very well agreed upon in the high temperature superconductivity, although many other things not agreed upon. What happens if you make a sample which has exactly the same uh, TC, but it's on the other side of the maximum in TC in, in the region where we call on the dope Cooper. Do the same experiment, you see very different curves. Uh, at, low, at low energy, you kind of still see that U shape, that V shaped curve is for the most part consistent with pairing being uh, sort of V uh, wave like. But then you get this other energy scale which persists to temperatures well above TC, and it constitutes a phase of matter, which we call the pseudo gap phase in the cuprate, which we do not understand. And this is a phase that uh, we actually, superconductivity actually comes from if you, if you dope the system after you have killed the antiferromagnet, the Martin solution. 
Okay, so these are the two characteristics of doing these experiments on high temperature supernova. Let's see what happens if you do the same experiments on, on magic angle graphene. So I showed you Pablo's plot. This is the insulator, this is the superconductor. I showed you plots like eight voltage this way, probing, probing electronic states in this direction, spectroscopy. And what, you, what I want you to focus on is these regions of dark blue, okay? Which is what is indicated in these dark blue regions is where the tunneling into the, into the system shows an energy gap. So the conductivity is low here. It shows an energy gap. The insulator will show you an energy gap. And that's, uh, this insulator has a big energy gap. That's the, that's the boring insulator where you fill a completely empty or completely fill those two bands. This one is actually not a gap, although it looks kind of like a gap uh, in this sample. But this one is actually a gap around between two electrons in this whole manifold, like I showed you. That's the correlated insulator, which we don't understand. And there is this other gap here. And I told you that the superconductor, whether it's S wave or D wave, it doesn't matter, should have some sort of a gap. But you see, in our experiment, they kind of look the same. How could you tell one is a superconductor and what's an insulator? This is where we, we came up to use our instrument in a slightly different fashion. We do tunneling, we have the sharp tip, which is sort of hovering over the surface, it's about five or six angstroms away from the surface of the material. But we can be daring and just bring it down and touch the sample. We touch the sample, we have a normal electrode on one side, which is actually making a contact uh, with, it, with the electrode on the other side, which is a superconductor. There is something very special happens when you try to put electrons from a normal metal into a superconductor. This is a process that is, well, at, at energies above the energy gap, the superconductor, that's fine. You can just add what we call electrons or remove electrons. This makes quasi particles. Below the energy gap, uh, adding single electrons is forbidden. The system is paired up. But there is something that can happen, which is an electron can go in, a hole can reflect back, and as a result, two electrons can go forward as Cooper pairs. This process is called Andrea reflection. And what it would do, so I showed you the, what the curve would look like if you have tunneling into a conventional superconductor, has a gap. Now, if you bring this contact and making a point contact, actually the conductivity uh, would actually double when you're in the low energy region where this process dominates. Why does it double? Well, it's very simple to understand. If I take this diagram and make this normal, I have some conductance, I'm making the superconductor, this has, no, this has infinite conductivity, zero resistance. The resistance of this device, the conductance of this junction should double. That's sort of the basic way you can kind of understand it. We did this exact same experiment uh, in, the, in the doping region where we expect this material to be a superconductor, and indeed we see this enhanced conductivity, <clears throat> although the shape of this is not uh, that you expect very simply. The fact that there is this enhanced conductivity gives us a tool to know the material is actually superconductor. What's kind of cool is you can now combine these two experiments side by side. You can do an experiment where you measure what, this, what do things look like when we tunnel, have a gap or no gap. And what do things look like when you touch the sample, see if there is, what does the conductivity of that junction look like? The function of varying uh, basically the density. It's kind of nice. See, oh, that's dark blue. That's an insulator. That has a gap. Okay, that's dark blue. That's, that's an insulator. Good. This is dark blue. Oh, wait a minute. That's not dark blue here. That's enhanced. It's a superconductor. Oh, look at that one. That was also insulated. So this gives us a way to distinguish insulators from superconductors, you know, without having to kind of go in and make the sort of transport measurement locally. Okay, so very good. So we have we have our, we know the sample is superconducting underneath our tip, and we have now made these measurements where we are we are probing what does it look like when you tunnel into this super superconducting thing. Remember what I showed you with aluminum? It had this nice sharp uh, 
in going to zero is actually a very similar superconductor in terms of its TC, it's just around one Kelvin. Here you see this, this, these are two different devices, these two different samples, just to give you a sense of variations. We always are, are observe this V-shaped tunneling into this superconductor when we adjust our gate voltage in the superconductor. So what we believe based on this data, which we have tried to analyze uh, using whether S wave or, or, or E wave or P wave superconductivity, is that if you have a, a, an S wave superconductor, it's very difficult to understand the spectra unless you make a lot of fine tuning in terms of what the S wave superconductivity is doing in the material. But if you just postulate that the material has a, uh, a, a a pairing gap, which like the cooperates, has some directions where the pairing gap vanishes, then it, it matches what we see experimentally. The first observation here is that the, the tunneling into the superconductor is, looks very much like having a high temperature superconductor. It actually looks like high temperature superconductor in more than one way. Remember, I showed you that in the high temperature superconductors, when you raise the temperature and you go above TC, there is some gaps that remain. This thing does the same thing. Ignore this, this is busy. This is, is just tuning the gate uh, to a region where we would have superconductivity at low temperature, or we are at higher temperature than the superconductor. And just like high temperature superconductors, you see these remnants of an energy gap uh, in tunneling electron into the system. So in the lingo of our field, we say that the, the system has a pseudo gap phase from which at high temperature, you cool it down a uh, superconductivity emerges. But what's also interesting about the system is it's very, uh, on high temperature superconductors takes oh, hundreds of Tesla, we haven't actually been able to reach it, to actually quench superconductivity completely. This system, it takes very little magnetic field to kill the state where the resistance goes to zero. And what's nice about this, uh, prob uh, this property is that we can do our experiments where we tunnel into the superconductor and we see whether we, we see a gap, whether this gap is you know, V-shaped or U-shaped, that's one feature. But what happens if you have very low temperature and just apply magnetic field, kill superconductor? It, well, and it, this came as a surprise to us that this doesn't look to be very sensitive to suppression of the zero resistance state. Could never do this experiment in high temperature superconductors because we could never apply a large enough field to basically kill the superconductivity uh, completely in the laboratory bars where you do these experiments. So the presence of this energy gap raises some very interesting questions which we are trying to understand now. Is this a system which actually is already paired up before the resistance goes to zero? And the presence of that pairing is what gives you this characteristic pseudo gap in our experiment. That's one possibility. It's really very exciting. Actually, that question is one which is people thought about in the cooperates as well, other unconventional super. The other one is that maybe you kind of need to make some special organization of electrons, uh, which creates this energy gap. Unless you make this energy gap, you cannot have a superconductor state. Right now, we don't know which one of these is the answer. Now, I think I got Tom, the boss. 10 minutes, five minutes, okay. Let me show you some other uh, resemblance to, so when we do these uh, fitting experiments, we can also ask, you know, what's the ratio of this gap to the TC of the superconductor? If you have a mean field, you know, BCS uh, transition, we expect this to be about three to five, you know, depending on whether you're a strong coupling superconductor. So this material shows this ratio to be enormous. This is a common characteristic we see in a lot of unconventional superconductors we don't understand. And what's interesting is I told you when we do this contact measurement, this contact measurement is a very sensitive probe of superconductivity as well. And it's the signal, this, this enhanced Andreev signal, which I told you comes on because you have this Andreev reflection. 
strength of this signal goes away to zero as you approach TC. Now, if you look at this curve, the characteristic details aside, you kind of read off, you know, what is the energy scale which you kind of are sensitive to this process of Andreev reflection. It looks like this energy scale is, is the smaller energy scale. In this experiment, when I'm tunneling, when I'm touching the sample, then when I try to tunnel an electron kind of in, the in the regime where I'm not touching the sample. These two ratios, you know, these are the sample dependent, but they, we see quite a lot of the difference between these two energy scales. It's very reminiscent of what we have seen in the high temperature superconductor. Remember I showed you this plot where we have these uh, samples with very low doping. Uh, there were sort of two energy scales in the data, uh, which we see. And this is some old experiments, which actually doing this same kind of analysis that I'm doing. In this plot, they're plotting the energy scale for touching the sample and rare reflection. In this plot, they're, they're plotting what it looks like in the tunneling experiment. They see two, very, they, you know, this is very old work. And they see two energy scales uh, associated with the nature of uh, this superconductor. And you can put these two energy scales from our measurements uh, on, on a plot uh, as a function of, of, of filling. So remember, here was our insulator. You put two electrons or two, you have two holes or two electrons in a manifold of eight. Okay. And you have the insulator has a gap. This gap sort of hovers around the sort of minus two. And then you, you create another state, which we know is a superconductor. This is the, the signal uh, from that touching experiment. And that has one energy scale. And the energy scale for tunneling is, is different. So this is also very reminiscent of it. So some have argued that this one may be very sensitive to this coherence. And this one may be something else. And we, we just don't know right now. This is the interpretation of this experiment. So I think I'll show you one more experiment and I'll stop. Remember I told you we stack these um, high layers of graphene or whenever we have these 2D materials, we put them on a layer of boron nitride. Boron nitride protects us from kind of fluctuations of the properties, the dielectric of, of the gate. You can ask what will happen if you, you know, mess around with the alignment of this uh, layer with the layer underneath. So remember, it's just one degree. They're almost aligned with one another. And ask what, what happens if you make the boron nitride aligned with this structure? You get some very nice images in the STM where you have very good alignment, uh, which actually tells you that there is this sort of a alignment between the two different more beating in the sample. Then you can repeat the same experiments that I showed you. What's really remarkable is that this system basically doesn't become a superconductor just because of this alignment of the layer underneath with the one degree misaligned born uh, the bilayer graphic. It makes an insulator uh, uh, near what, uh, when you have zero doping in the system. This is actually expected to happen uh, because uh, this is a very special point that has to do with those direct direct nodes of graphene, and the breaking of this symmetry between the boron and nitride breaks the AB sublattice symmetry in graphene. It's rid of that uh, protected direct point. It creates a, a gap in the system. You notice there is you know no correlated insulator down here, no superconductivity. It does other things that are interesting in the material, which I won't have time to discuss, uh, but this is, adds another important piece to understanding the mechanism of superconductivity. And uh, it, it also relates to the fact that when you have uh, maybe certain kind of symmetries, <laughs> C2T is the symmetry that this system has, maybe those symmetries are required for the pairing to actually take place. This may give us another clue how to make uh, the right uh, description of the superconductivity. So um, this is actually, um, the sort of wrapping up what I told you today about superconductivity, the shape of the superconducting curve being consistent uh, with that of a nodal superconductor, having a pseudo gap phase, and, and, and these very large ratios of gap to TC are indicative of, of not just having an unconventional superconductor in 
how, what its phase diagram looks, I mean, some very specific features of its electronic clock. Now, I don't have time to uh, talk about topology. I thought that would be a bit faster, but let me just give you a feeling why this material is even more special than just having flat bands. So it inherits uh, the, the properties of graphene, which has this very phase associated with around the Dirac nodes. And uh, so it, these flats, but if you really zoom in uh, around a K and K prime point, it actually has these nodal touching points between the two flat bands. <laughs> and um, I, I told you about alignment with BN, which gaps this system. When you gap this system, you actually expose the, the, the presence of topology in the system uh, in, in a way where uh, you, you, you find that there is quantum anomalous Hall effect uh, you know, at zero magnetic field. You get a quantized Hall conductance in this system, uh, which is very special uh, because what you have created are, are bands that have finite churn number, uh, which when you, when you fill them, uh, for example, under the right conditions of number of electrons in these bands, you actually get a quantized Hall conductance. It's kind of, it's remarkable. It turns out that you actually don't even need, uh, you don't even need the boron nitride. If you, if you go to very low temperatures and they make very clean samples, uh, it turns out that uh, you, you can actually create these uh, uh, finite churn number uh, states. I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but we have a way in which we can characterize these churn numbers by measuring their gaps. This is a work that many of us in this field are doing. Uh, by looking at also the topological properties of the system uh, and showing that, that under certain condition, it can actually have a quantized Hall conduct. Even uh, work from Amir Yacobi introduced me, uh, shows that we may even have fractional of Hall conductance under certain conditions. All right, so uh, they're not only correlated, but they're also logical. Let me conclude. Um, and the one last point about these topological phases, uh, for example, these finite uh, churn insulators, which I flashed here, is that they're very special kinds of ferromagnets. They're not spin ferromagnets that we are very commonly familiar with, actually orbital ferromagnets, in which electrons are, are, are in these very novel states where they have orbital ferromagnetism is being created uh, in, these, uh, in these special so let me tell you what we are doing looking ahead. I, I showed you a lot of uh, curves look like spectra uh, you know, of different kinds. And I told you that uh, there is this manifold of very exciting, uh, many type of quantum states you can make. Mm -hmm. And what's really cool is that all the different kinds of quantum states you can make actually have wave functions on the atomic scale that are very different from one another. I showed you almost no images except a few images of the lattice of graphene. But with our tool, we can go in and interrogate electron at specific energies and ask what the wave function, the square of the local density of states look like in real space. It turns out all the different type of states that people are proposing, the real space signatures we could measure with our, our instrument. This is what we are working on. And looking kind of beyond graphene, this is a field that's really exploding because you know we have, as I mentioned, many different kinds of 2D materials, many different ways of putting them on top of one another, kind of like Legos of things you can put on top of one another. And you know, the theorists are giving a lot of ideas on what kind of things to put on top of one another, what kind of conditions to create. And we have a lot of different knobs uh, in terms of knobs in terms of twisting knobs in terms of which layers you use, knobs in terms of applying magnetic field, knobs such as producing electric field between the layers, you know, by putting in a sort of a situation where you have a displacement field, a sort of monitoring, changing the charge density between the layers in the material. This is kind of leading to a kind of a more revolution. I'll stop there if you have any questions. One question. What about visualizing vortices and superconducting states? 
So, you know, the magnetic field that it takes to kill superconductivity is very low. So the distance between vortices at such low fields will be very large. Like the Abrikosov lattice would have very large lattice constant. <laughs> now we never did the experiment, which we should have done, which we will, which is just apply a large field in this pseudo gap phase, which is see if there are such weird or weird objects there that may be vortices. That's where the status is. you distinguish between strain in the graphene and normal distortion of piezoelectric actuator? Excellent question. So we can we can of course calibrate you know, our our the question is whether we have if you have some sort of um, you know distortion in the way our image is showing of our microscope because we are, we are using piezoelectric to scan across this field of view. It turns out that the field of view are very small relatively mm -hmm. speaking and we can always look at what looks like in other materials, like it's just a monolayer of graphene. And so we can, we can distinguish strain. What's the, what's the uh, magnetic moment of this article? How big is the magnetic moment? Maybe Ashwin can help me out with it. one or two, it's like small. Or remember, certainly. I mean, people have it hasn't been measured, but it's 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 can people have calculated to compute them. But can you measure them? So Andrea Young has done some nanosquid experiments, and Elie Zeldoff do see some magnetic information. But it, I think the resolution is uh, we're using a nanosquid, which has a resolution which I think is too imprecise for the, the length scale we are talking. There is some. There is definitely magnetic. This magnetic signal. It's just not very clear. Uh, are the durations of two days over PC that you show that the same for all dosing selection for conductivity or they vary? They vary from device to device, but they are consistently different from each other. And I mean that as a function of dosing uh, or feeding factor, what is the conductivity is then? Show some some range of yes. Does the ratio remain the same? I no, I don't think it remains the same. Does it? Does yeah. Yeah, that, that was for a particular device. I can show you another one which looks a little bit more dome like. There is some variation. But the fact that they're different is one thing I can be very confident about. Understand about vortices. You only need to have one vortex in your field of view to see. It. Yeah, you have to get very lucky. <laughs> you have to pin it at that location. You have to find it, right? Yeah. So, at uh, uh, 100 milli Tesla, the distance between vortices would be very large. As long as you're well, as long as you're lucky, you have a sample that's presumably if you're a little bit below HC2, you have basically one vortex per coherence site. Yeah, if you do the numbers, you'll find out that the distance between them is very large. The question is, what are the length for your lengths? Uh, in dynamic, what does that mean? Yes, we can, we can discuss this. Uh, that's, well, uh, from coherence length is of the order of the Morel length scale, I believe. Yeah. Uh, the Cooper pairs at new at uh, it's comparable. That has been proposed as one of the regimes that we could uh, that could be taking place in in some of these uh, some of the of the papers in this. I think there's actually a paper on the tri layer which argues that maybe they have seen some evidence of it. All right, I think we can wrap up and say that.